we are approaching a new year. Today, I was reminded, is New Year's Eve, which means there are uh, a lot of New Year's resolutions in this building here. It seems like every time we approach a new year, we start to think, okay, what do I want to change for the upcoming year? We always seem to have a desire to change. Right? Change can be good, right? I mean, it can be bad sometimes, but a lot of the times it can be good. We make resolutions such as, you know, weight loss or attending church more or maybe, you know, working on, you know, an attitude or whatever it is. We always try to make a change that we think will make us better, make us a better person, or maybe it's something that we really need to get done. And when we look back at our life, we can see a whole bunch of changes that have occurred and they have worked out to, you know, be for the better. I see changes in my life. One of the changes uh, that happened was, and I got married, and for all you married people in this room, you know that that is a significant change as you go from your own individual life and now you're trying to come together with someone else's individual life and you guys are working together as husband and wife to learn how to be together. That was a big change in my life. And just when I think I have it figured out, then we start having kids, right? We have Ezra, that was a big change as well. Right? We were warned in marriage counseling, hey, when kids come, there's going to come these other changes. And sure enough, that is what happened. And just whenever my wife and I think that Ezra's the perfect child and let's go ahead and have more, he, he catfished us in a way. Right? We have a daughter, and you know they always say boys are easier, and I see why. Right? Having two kids and one boy, one girl, that, that's a big change. You know, and I'm learning how to do it. And as I get older, I continue to lose my hair. And if any of you guys knew me in high school or even younger, I had the big afro, and there's no way I can get that back now. Right? Change happens all the time. However, the biggest change for me happened in college. And I know I've shared this story multiple times. It's emotional every time that I share it, just because of how good God is. I had this idea in my head that I was a Christian, even at a young age. You know, when you're young, you, you think anything makes you a Christian. I thought, my uncle's a preacher, so that makes me, you know, kin to the, you know, kin to the Christian faith. So I'm a Christian, right? And as I get older, I realize that's not what it's about, you know, and so I started going to church often. I participated in youth group. I went off to college, and uh, when I would come back on the weekends, I would help out teaching Sunday school and, and doing all these things that are good things to do. However, I didn't really make you, make me a believer. And I truly believed with all of my heart that God was real. I truly did. I believed that God was real. I thought the world showed evidence in a creator, and I knew that God of the Bible was God. However, I didn't submit to him, and that's the difference. One day, a teammate of mine who was, who was not a believer, he went to church with another teammate of mine, and he came back and started talking about the Bible, and I got real excited to really show off what I know, so to speak, so I started talking to him, and telling him all these great things about God and different passages and he looked at me and for a second there was silence and he said Joe I didn't know you were a Christian and that stuck with me and for that next week that's all I could hear on my free time on my downtime whenever I was alone it just kept ringing in my ears and I thought how could he not know that I was not a, how did he not know that I was a believer and it's because uh, while I was doing all those good things I was secretly living a sinful perverted crooked life I realized that I was living a life of my own desires of my own will of my own pleasures and by God's grace a little while later I felt the Lord drawing to me granting me repentance and I cried out to him and submitted to him and from that moment I was forever changed. It was as if I was a new person. I was brand new. 
and my teammates kind of made a joke out of, out of it, and it ended up being one of the best compliments I ever got. They used to call me the new Joe, right? They would go out to parties and say, we want the old Joe to come. And I said, well, the new Joe doesn't do that anymore, you know, and it was as if I was a new creature. I was a new creation. God had saved me and made me new, and all of us here who have been saved by the grace of God can look back in our life and see the drastic change of salvation. We can see the change that was made when God showed mercy on us and when he gave us grace. We were made new. And the same happened to a man in scripture that we want to talk about today, Saul of Tarsus. He was changed and even given a new name. And I, I want to talk about how amazing his transformation was because as each of us, when we become a believer, we are changed, and it does affect those around us. It affects our friends. It affects our family. It affects us, our relationships. But Saul's transformation affected the world. So before we start, I want to find out what kind of character Saul was. And we'll be going a lot in the book of Acts, and we'll start off in Acts chapter 7. But first, let's pray. Father, you are gracious to us. We thank you, Lord, for showing your love to us. We ask, Lord, that as we are gathered here, your saints, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and that we would uh, see what your scripture is saying and see what, you, what your scripture is asking us to do. Father, we thank you. We give you all praise. Amen. So we're going to start off with this man. It's the killing of... Uh, a disciple named Stephen. It's in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 54. Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 54. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Being filled of the Holy Spirit, he, talking about Stephen here, gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice. They covered their ears and rushed him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen, and, and as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. So here's an account of a godly man, a man who was a disciple of the Lord, being stoned. And when we think of someone being put to death, we usually think of criminals who were, who were vicious and They've done their their sins have been tremendous and, and ter, you know terrific. And what did Stephen do to be put to death? What did Stephen do to deserve death? Well, Scripture tells us he was a man full of God's grace and power. Scripture tells us that he performed wonders and signs, and he spoke wisdom through the Spirit. And he was set up by some and taken to the Jewish court and was asked to defend these claims about him. And the way he defended himself is he preached some sort of like a history lesson, so to speak, against Israel. He spoke a history lesson showing Israel's disobedience to the Lord, showing Israel's disobedience and how they persecuted those who would predict the coming of the Messiah and how they also betrayed and killed the Messiah, the righteous one. This, in the court's eyes, was grounds for stoning, was grounds to be put to death. And we are introduced in this scene to a man named Saul. In verse 58, we see that the witnesses are laying their garments at Saul's feet, which might have meant that he might have been the one to order the killing, or maybe it was just mentioned so to introduce to let us know Saul is coming up and here is who Saul is. But in verse 60, Stephen does something remarkable. 
And this is important to the sermon today. He asks the Lord to forgive them, to forgive the ones who were stoning him. And we see that Saul was there in that moment. And that is going to become important later on. But nonetheless, we see who Saul was. He approved this killing of a faithful follower. We see that in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. You see, this incident, this stoning of Stephen, it, it created a great persecution of the church. Believers started to scatter. They fled. They, they hid. They got out of town. However, the disciples, they stayed behind. And you see, Saul, in verse 3, he began ravaging the church. He was entering house after house, dragging off men and women. The death of Stephen was not enough for Saul. He went dragging out men and women and throwing them out and sentencing them. And I'm reminded through history lessons that we learned growing up in school about World War II and the Holocaust. And I'm reminded about the SS officers who would kick down doors and would drag out the Jews and take them to concentration camps. And when I read this passage here of what Saul was doing, it speaks parallels to what the SS officers would do. It was wicked. It was evil. Was, was this man Saul a God-hater? In our eyes, we look and we say, absolutely, he was a God-hater. He hated the people of God. However, in his eyes, and in the eyes of the Jewish elite and the Pharisees, it was actually quite opposite. Why was Saul doing this? Because he loved God so much in his eyes. That's what he claims. In Philippians 3, and you don't have to flip there, I'll read it. Philippians 3, verse 5, it says, Circumcised, this is uh, Paul, uh, bragging, uh, in a sense, bragging about himself to show, hey, if anyone has the right to brag, you know, this is, this is who I was, but this is all worthless. And here's what he says. He says, circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law, of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, which is a very respected tribe, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, he knew the scripture well. He knew the law well. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. You see, Saul knew the, the law very well. He trained under a very famous teacher. He met the birth requirements. He loved the Judaic law so much that he persecuted the church because he saw this move of Christianity becoming a threat to Judaism. He saw that this was a threat to Judaism. He knew what Christians believed. He knew that they taught Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, which the Jews, the non-believing Jews, do not accept. So he considered Christians to be blasphemers and worthy of imprisonment and sometimes death. We're going to be in Acts 9, flip over to Acts 9, as we uh, go through the conversion of Saul, as we go through the salvation of Saul. Let's start off in Acts 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if, if any, if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You see, what we find out here in the very first verse, we see now Saul still. Right? This word still indicates that this was more than just a one-time occurrence. This wasn't just a one-time slip-up. It wasn't just a one-time thing. 
This became his mission. This became his obsession. Persecution of the saints to the point of death had become his identity in a sense. It's who he was. And he was receiving support from, his, from other Pharisees and even from the high priest. He was receiving support. And it says he was still breathing threats on murder. You see, this is more than just a verbal expression. This is more than just saying he was saying these things, that he was, he was threatening these Christians. When it says he was breathing threats, it's as if he was inhaling threats. He was, he was breathing it in. He was being fueled by it. It's what had fed him. The stoning of Stephen was not enough. He needed more. He would drag believers out of the way of their homes, and it was not enough for him. He wanted to exterminate the followers of Christ, and not just in Jerusalem, but everywhere. He was on a rampage. In Acts 26, 9-11, through 11, this is, Another account of Saul when he tells us what happened to him. Starting in verse 9, it says, So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often, in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. You see, Saul, after his conversion, he admits in his testimony of who he was, he admits he had become obsessed. He, he was convinced that he had to do everything he could to oppose the name of Jesus. Blood was on his hands. Many people were put to death because of him. He was obsessed with persecuting the church. He was traveling from city to city in a way of hunting them down. It became some sort of sport, in a sense, for Saul. And he would raid these cities and raid these synagogues with his whole crew behind him, his entourage, probably temple police, because he was supposed to be bringing people back, so he couldn't have done that alone. So he would have a crowd with him, and that if he would find any Christian, any person belonging to the way, he would bring them back from where they were to Jerusalem for sentencing. This is a pretty wicked man when we read about him. Pretty wicked man to be obsessed with the killing and imprisonment of followers of Christ. But it was on one of these journeys, as he was traveling to a different city, that the Lord did what at that time people would view as the impossible. It's at that time he did the impossible. And we read about it in verse 3 of Acts 9. 3 through 5. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. You see, it says, Suddenly there was a light. Could this have been the sun? Some skeptics believe that Saul may have just saw the sun on a very bright day. Well, the sun would not have just become so suddenly bright that it would cause Saul and his companions to fall to the ground in fear. And even in chapter 22 and 26 of Saul, these are his testimonies. He gives more details about what had happened. He says that it happened around noon when the sun would be the brightest. And why is that important? Because in chapter 26, we are told that the light was brighter than the sun. The light was brighter than the noonday sun. This light was separate from the sun. It couldn't have been the sun in the sky. I mean, the sun wouldn't and couldn't speak. Right, we were told in chapter 22, verse 9, that, Saul is, that Saul's companions heard the sound around them but could not make out the words of what was being spoke. Some people will claim that it was just a noonday thunderstorm. 
and it was the rumbling that everybody heard. But this account rules that out. Uh, it rules out the thunderstorm theory as one would be able to tell the rumbling of a thunderstorm versus words being spoken. You see, the detail of the sudden light from heaven and the voice is significant because it shows us, as it did Saul, that this was no ordinary incident. This was not just an incident of chance. This was a heavenly encounter with the, with the resurrected Christ. And what we read, he's, how does he address Saul? He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You see, the double use of names here is, is fascinating. There's only a handful of times in Scripture that, that you will see the Lord uh, calling someone by name twice. And every time he does, it's because there is an, an important message. There is something that needs to be said and that this person needs to hear. For example, we're going through Genesis. So we remember Abraham was commanded to go and sacrifice the son whom he loved. And Abraham was obedient to the Lord. And as he gets up, he does everything he needs to do. And he gets the knife and he gets ready to slaughter his son. But at the last minute, the Lord cries out and he says, Abraham. Abraham, and then the, the important message. We see it as Martha is complaining. The Lord says, Martha, Martha, listen, Martha. Right, this is important. We see it as Samuel was called into his ministry. Samuel, Samuel, and here we see it. We see it, it says, Saul, Saul. So what that means is this is something important. And what does the Lord ask Saul? Why? Do you persecute me? Well, how was Saul attacking Christ? This was after the, the this was after the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. I mean, Saul was attacking followers of Christ. He wasn't directly attacking the man named Jesus, right? How was it that Saul was attacking the Christ? Well, because Saul was attacking the church. And this is an indication of what we see that Christ is inseparable from his people. There is an unbreakable unity between Christ and his church. Christ purchased his church with his blood. So these five words that Jesus says proves that all believers worldwide, not just Jerusalem, not just Damascus, not just anywhere in America, but all believers worldwide are one with Christ because the church is the body of Christ we learned about that two weeks ago when I was up here we talked how the church makes up the body of Christ and Christ our Redeemer is the head of that body so anyone who persecutes God's people is actually attacking Christ that's why he asks and Saul responds he says who who are you Lord now remember it's 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 unlikely that Saul and Jesus' path, they would have crossed, their paths probably didn't cross during Jesus' ministry, right? Because Saul, he, he writes so many books in the, in, the, in the Bible, and he's accredited with so many of these books, and not once did he mention uh, crossing paths with the Messiah before his conversion, right? He doesn't mention it. That, that, that would be something that he probably would have, miss, would have mentioned, Saul didn't know who this was. Right? Saul probably never seen him before. He didn't know who this was. But look how he addresses him. He addresses him as Lord. He says, who are you, Lord? Now it is true, and some will argue, that this may just be him saying, sir. It's true that sometimes in Scripture when you say, Lord, it's, it's like a respect, like, like today we would say, sir. However, there's too much supernatural going on around Saul for him to say, I'm sorry, who are you, sir? It doesn't make sense. You see, Saul breathing in murderous threats, feeding off of it, obsessing over it, desiring it, craving it, identifying with it, being energized to go from town to town, not slowing down. He comes full speed into, into Damascus with the mission, and he gets stopped by the light, dead in his tracks. Not a step more. 
lights from heaven, brighter than the midday sun. The resurrected Christ appeared to Saul, calling him by name. Saul, Saul, listen up. Why are you persecuting me? Saul, in fear on the floor, says, Who are you, sir? No. Saul would say, Who are you, master? Who are you, Lord? Saul is in submission at this point to this figure. He's in submission to Christ. And he doesn't even know who this is yet. And Christ says, I am Jesus. And I believe in this moment that the Christian-hating, church-persecuting, chief sinner, as he addressed himself, Saul, is converted by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, is that enough just to be saved that Jesus would say, hey, I'm Jesus? Well, you got to remember, Saul knew the gospel. He knew it really well. It fueled him with anger. And that's what motivated him to go and do what he was doing, was the gospel that these Christians were preaching, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, that this Jesus is the Son of God, that he was crucified for our sins and resurrected to life. So when Saul sees and hears Christ on the road to Damascus, all doubt is gone. He's convicted of the bloodshed. He's needing the Lord's mercy. He now knows the truth and is converted. And how do we know Saul was truly converted? And it's the very next passage or the very next piece of scripture that I believe we find out that this is a true conversion. Acts 9, verse 6 through 9. This is what Jesus says. He says, But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. One of the first things Jesus did to Saul after his conversion, the very first thing, he gives him a command. He says, get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. You see, Saul's original plan was to go into the city and drag the Christians out to persecute the, the, the believers of the way. But now he's entering Damascus as a believer. Saul was obedient to the word. He was obedient to the Lord. He could have ordered his men, even though he was blind. He had enough of them with him. He could have ordered them to go and carry out the mission, to go carry out the task. But you see, Saul, in a single moment, was changed by Christ. The true believer listens to the voice of the Lord and responds in obedience. And that's what we see Saul do here. And we see another believer respond in obedience, even though skeptic, as we continue on down through this piece of scripture. Verses 10 through 20, we find a man named Ananias. Ananias is a well-respected leader. Right? He's, he's a Jewish leader. He's well-respected. He's known. He is a fellow believer. Verse 10, Now there is a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a, in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And look at Ananias. Look at the, look at the reputation that Saul of Tarsus had in verse 13. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you 
on the road by which you are coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. You see, Ananias, a well-respected believer, a, a fellow believer, was commanded by God to go and meet Saul of Tarsus, who had this reputation of who he was. He had the reputation of persecutor, of murderer. It was known what he was doing to the believers in Jerusalem. Ananias was told by the Lord, go to this man. He is waiting on you. And although Ananias seemed a little hesitant at first, he wanted to make sure he obeys the Lord, which is evidence of Ananias' salvation. Now, what was Saul doing for the three days while he was blind? What was he doing while he was waiting in that room? He was probably thinking about all the things he had done, all the ways he had persecuted uh, the Lord's people. He was, that was probably running in his mind. But verse 11 tells us exactly what he was doing. Verse 11 tells us that he was praying. He was praying to the Lord. You see, he was, he was having communion with the Lord. True communion with the Lord is also evidence of salvation. But what stands out to me the most in this is in verse 17 when we see Saul we know Saul's reputation we know Saul was this murderer he probably sat those three days thinking about the stoning of Stephen orchestrating it he was probably sat there thinking about all the people he had in prison he sat there thinking probably about all the bad things he had ever done he was probably thinking I am unworthy and look at how Ananias addresses him he says brother Saul. You see that? Ananias, the well-respected believer, the, the, the true, he's a true disciple of the Lord. He goes to this Saul of Tarsus who, who had been known for all these bad things, who has this past. Ananias knows that if the Lord calls you and draws you and grants you repentance, that you are made new and you are now adopted into the family of God. And he addresses Saul as brother the comfort these words must have been to Saul to be called a brother in the faith. After his past, the comfort this must have brought, after days of no doubt thinking of what he had done, this must have brought comfort to him. Saul is then healed, baptized, fellowships with the disciples, and begins to proclaim Jesus as Son of God. That is a transformation. And I want us to jump back to Acts chapter 7, verse 60. The stoning of Stephen. It's what we started with here today. In verse 60, Stephen, then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He didn't take a nap. He didn't take a little siesta. He didn't do that. Right? Stephen died. That's what the scripture is saying. And with his dying breath, with everything he had in him, he loudly prayed a prayer for his enemy. He loudly said, Lord, do not hold this against them. In other words, Lord, please forgive them. And the Lord God answered that prayer by saving the one who approved of the killing. That's Saul. Now I'll read to you 1 Timothy 1 here, verse 12 through 17. This is, this is Paul as he's talking. Uh, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me in service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant 
with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. In other words, Paul, he saw himself as the worst of all, the chief sinner. Yet, verse 16, yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Saul admits he was a blasphemer. He admits he was a violent man. He admits he was a murderer. He admits he was a persecutor. He admits he's an enemy of the cross. He proclaims himself to be the worst of all time. And I know I'm not the only one here that has ever felt that way. He proclaims to be the worst of them all. And he became Paul, a man who served the Lord faithfully, who authored many books of Scripture through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who was imprisoned for the gospel, who was beat for the gospel, who was left for dead for the gospel. He was stoned for the gospel. He was a faithful servant of our Lord. You see, this, this salvation, this transformation, it happens in all of us, we who come to faith. We are enemies of the cross. And because of the grace and mercy of God, when he grants us repentance, we become his adopted children. And if somebody asked me, without using the Bible, without using Scripture, prove to me that God is real, I would say, look at his people. Look at who they were before the cross. And you explain to me how somebody could just make this resolution and say, I'm going to be this better person and show evidence like Saul did, to show evidence of salvation like Saul. Someone as far gone as Saul being changed and conformed and, and, and changed into Paul, that is evidence of our God. That is evidence that our God is the living God. How can this transformation like this take place? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And I love this because this kind of transformation, this kind of treatment that Saul got from the Lord, it's not just for Saul. Verse 17 in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone, you see, it goes out to anyone. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter what you've done. It does, God doesn't need you to fix yourself up a little bit before bowing to him at the cross. He doesn't need that. But look at this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Only in Christ can we be made new. Only in Christ do we have hope. Only in Christ can we go from a God-hater to an adopted son and daughter. Only in Christ can we be sanctified. Only in Christ can we be matured spiritually. And only in Christ is the salvation of sins. And salvation is for all. doesn't matter your background. doesn't matter what religion you came from. It doesn't matter what you have done in the past. Salvation is for all who would call upon the name of the Lord and repent of their sins. Amen? Let's pray. Father, Lord, you are good. You are kind. You are merciful, gracious, loving. Lord, you are king. You are the one who grants repentance. Lord, we are encouraged to see Saul, this account of Saul and what you've done in this man's life from taking him from who he was to who you want him to become. Lord, we thank you that you work that way in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that, that you call us to you. And you don't just call us to you, but you continue to sanctify us. Father, you do so 
not because we deserve it, but you do so because you are glorified when we, when we call upon your name, when you save us, Lord. We give you all praise. Amen.